happens to say yes this time. And just to make it, make it real for us, let's, let's imagine how we would, it would play out for us. This guy, this eunuch that he encounters, okay, he, he goes, okay, there's a road in, in, you know, from Gaza, from Jerusalem to Gaza. He went to, to Jerusalem to worship. He is going towards Gaza, probably back to Ethiopia. And it's not this one guy on a chariot. This is the minister of finance of an empire, right? It's not just the country. It's not Ethiopia how we see it now. We see Ethiopia just as another African country these days. Back then, it was called the Empire of Kush, and it covered three different countries, Ethiopia, Sudan, and another one. <laughs> Somalia. Somalia. And at the time, like, and, and for us as Westerners, it's really hard for us to to go, oh, this is a big deal because we know, we know what's going on in Somalia. If you read the news, not a lot is going on in Somalia. Actually, some bad things are happening in Somalia. But at the time, this was a flourishing region. And it was an empire that, that, that spanned three different countries. So this guy was a big, big deal. If he was traveling in a chariot, he was not traveling alone. This was an entourage. Imagine, guards, servants, slaves, food, gear. Right? It probably was a, it was a thing. Imagine if you were the person who was asked to go on that road, alone. No introduction whatsoever. And go, go check out that chariot. First of all, it's dangerous. Somebody can kill you just by approaching the chariot. Second, it's really awkward. Don't you think? <laughs> God told me to speak to you. So you're that guy. <laughs> right? It's really fascinating to think about that. And so imagine how that all played out. So in Acts 8, verse 30, it, it starts talking about that. This is how it happened. It says, Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet. Do you, not understand what you're, do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can, how can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. Just think about that. This, think about just the, the physical manifestation of this, of this scene, right? What do you do? You, there's, there's an entourage of people going, there's guards. First of all, you, you get the courage to sh show up, and then you run to it. You have to run. And you run alongside, right? You have to run alongside long enough to understand this guy is reading something out loud and understand what it is. And then as you're running, you start talking to the dude. <laughs> How did that look like? Right? What, I mean, what an amazing exchange. And what amazing obedience on the part of the guide. He had the humility and the obedience to speak to him. And then he was invited into the chariot. This is the, the passage of scripture that the, the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb before the, share, the shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth in his humiliation. He was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is this prophet talking about himself or someone else? And then Philip began with the very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus all the way. Right? The guide is an important element in, in all of the stories. And I'll tell you this, 99.9999% of the time where God want, decides to work in your life, he will use a hum human being to work in your life, to speak truth to you. And also, every single person who enters into a relationship with Christ is automatically invited to become a guide to others. And the problem with that is that we're super insecure and we don't like rejection and we don't even feel we're worthy to be guides. And what I want to tell you is that you are worthy to be a guide because it's not really about you being good enough. It's about God choosing you. That is all there is to it. And my question to you is, if you are a Christian, if you want to be a Christian, you need to understand and get comfortable with the idea that you will be used by God to transform lives. And you will be told to go places and speak to people. And you will feel weird. And you will feel, why am I running by this chariot right now? And this guard on the right looking particularly menacing to me right now, so I should probably peel away. And you will have the courage, if you are true, to not do that. And to speak truth into people's lives, even if it feels weird, even if you feel like you're not worthy. 
because that will transform lives. Think about this. What, what, what had happened if somebody didn't speak life into you? Can you imagine the domino effect of that not happening? Think about the person who did that for you. The many people who did that for you, not only in the beginning of your journey, but throughout your journey. Think about what, if, what things you would have not learned, what sins would, you have, would, would have you not repented of, right? What changes you wouldn't have made, what victories you wouldn't have won if people didn't speak to you and were guides to you. So let's, let's switch over to speak to, before you start get, feeling all guilty about stuff, let's talk about seekers a little bit. Seekers, there's, there's three types of seekers. And, and the reason, I want to explain what seekers means. In my mind, seeker is a posture of heart. It's not just a season in life, right? It's not that you're a seeker and then you find it and then you've arrived. That's not how it works. That's why the word disciple is the operative word for follower of Christ. You don't stop learning. So it's a posture of heart. So if you're a seeker, what kind of seeker can you be? Well, you can be, I have three categories for you. One is that the enlightened seeker, right? The enlightened seeker is basically someone who's already learned something, has fixed some stuff, is things are running better, but you want more. And the danger with an enlightened seeker, and I hope you're an enlightened seeker, if you're an active member of a church, if you practice discipleship, you should stay an enlightened seeker, right? Because, there are things, wondrous things that God has in store for you that you haven't learned, that you haven't experienced yet throughout your life, all the way to eternity. So if you stop seeking, you're no longer enlightened sort of automatically, if you think about it. Because you need to know that you don't know. But the danger of being an enlightened seeker is that an enlightened seeker doesn't feel the pain as much. Because you've fixed stuff, you've aligned yourself with God, things are evolving, your family's a little bit better, your relationships are better, maybe your job is better, your addictions are better, your temptations are weaker, right? Things are much more aligned, so you don't feel as desperate. You don't feel the pain. So the enlightened seeker needs to find it in himself or herself. I need more and God has more for it. I need to keep seeking. I need to be curious. I need to ask. I need to pursue. That's the enlightened seeker. So there's a plus and a minus, right? The, a, a pro and a con. Second type of seeker is the limping seeker. The limping seeker is the guy or girl who has figured out a relationship with God, entered it, learned some stuff, and then things went south. So you have a limp. You're still on the journey, but it sort of hurts a little bit. You know, things dried up. You thought your, your marriage is going to be this way, but it's not. You thought the kids are going to turn out this way, but they're not. You thought your career will take off and your, your peace that you would experience would be a, of one kind, but you still feel this anxiety and angst and depression, perhaps. You know, all kinds of stuff. So you're limping and you're not giving up, right? You're still on the journey. You're still practicing discipleship, perhaps. Or you're coming to church. You're reading your Bible. You're doing the things that I, you know they're life-giving, but you're limping. You have a limp and... It's hard, you know? It's hard. Have you ever been there? I've been there. You're wounded. Here's the third type, the desperate seeker. And the desperate seeker is the one who has, clearly he's not on the right path, and just is feeling the pain. And the advantage of the desperate seeker, there is, there is complete clarity that you have nothing and that you need to change everything. And that's actually a, a great, great advantage to have. Right? Because you're, you don't do half measures when you're desperate that way. You go, you know what? I'm all in. Right? You need redemption. You need forgiveness. You feel so much shame. You feel like things are just collapsing around you. That is the desperate seeker. So here are the obstacles of a di the different types of seekers. The enlightened one, the obstacle for you is independence. Right? And pride. Because you've achieved things. You feel better about stuff. And you, you have your act together, actually. You know, there's some corrections, there's some tweaking to do. And what happens then, and I'll tell you, I, I wish I could tell you I'm not that person, and I totally am that person, and it's maddening. It's maddening th that I can go for a whole week sometimes and don't feel that desperate longing for God's guidance and forgiveness. Easy, and then wake up one morning and go, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? I feel I can do it myself, and I know for a fact that I cannot do it myself. 
I feel like I'm, I have it all figured out that my talent, my training, right? My strength are enough for me to progress and to bless people and to do what I do. And they are not enough, not even close to enough. And that's very dangerous to stay in that place. And I find myself in that place. And I have to just really beg God, God, give me a heart of flesh. Give me a desperate heart. Give me a heart that wants more. Give me a heart that is broken for my sin. Regardless of how much I'm removed from the bad stuff, how many decades, right? Regardless how much I don't, I don't experience catastrophic failure around me. That is, the, that is the obstacle. The obstacle for limping seeker is that you can adopt very easily a victim mentality. It's basically this place where you, you know, things happen to you. And you go, well, things happen to me. And here I am, a victim. Right? I was hurt by somebody. I tried my best. And I did all the right stuff. I followed the rules. And I still faced divorce or a bad marriage. And I worked so hard and my company still went, still went under. And then you fall into this place that is actually very comfortable being a victim because it requires zero on your part, zero effort. Right? And you fall into a victim mentality. That's the obstacle for a limping seeker. The, the, the obstacle for, for a desperate seeker is hopelessness. It's basically this, this, this overarching feeling that nothing can go well. There's no hope. And you get stuck with this. You get stuck with this. Here are the solutions. The enlightened uh, seeker, re recommit to a life of dependence, of full dependence. And that requires an intentionality, an effort, almost like a mechanical, I will not fall into pride and independence. I need discipleship. I need people in my life. I need accountability. I need to confess my sin. I will not fall into that. And making an effort, an intentional effort to recommit to a life of full dependency. This, this, the solution for the limping seeker it is this, understanding that God owes you nothing. And the universe owes you nothing. And your job and your former wife or your boss that was mean to you, that life doesn't owe you anything. Because when you uh, fall into a victim mentality, you become entitled. Somebody owes me something, my raise, my career. You know? And it's just not true. It's a lie. Here's the solution for you. You're welcome. And for the desperate, it's to turn yourself in. And that's hard, even for the desperate seeker, who is hopeless sometimes. It's hard to turn yourself in. You could be absolutely miserable and completely arrogant at the same time. Have you noticed that? I'm going, yeah, I'm not turning myself in at all. And the solution for you, if you're in that place where things are sort of going south quickly, turn yourself in. Just entrust yourself to, to God, the Bible, to the church. Here, there are people here who can take care of you, talk to you, guide you. And if they do, and if they take time out of their lives, please listen to them. Please listen to them and do as you're told. And I don't say that in a, in a mean way. I, I say that in, in a way that this is literally your solution. Because if you're in a place where you're misaligned with, with God in, to, in, to such a degree where things go south quickly, it's because, it's because you can't see, you're deaf, and, and, and you can't see, and you don't know where to go. Therefore, you need to choose to trust somebody. Right? Turn yourself in. Turn yourself in. Just say, okay, you, you seem like a good person. Tell me what to do. You know? What are you going to have to lose? You don't have much to lose, quite frankly. And that's the solution. The worst that can happen is that, that things stay bad. Well, they're bad anyway. Right, just do it. In Acts 8.36, it continues. It says, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. 
what can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. Then they came up out of the water. The spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Went on his way rejoicing. You know, this is the beauty of this, of this scripture. And this is, you know, sometimes they call it a chariot ride Bible study, right? It's because in a span of a chariot ride, this seeker went from, what is it that I don't know? Right? In a span of one chariot ride. And that's the, I mean, this is an illustration of turning yourself in completely. You meet a guy who's running next to your chariot ride. Okay, messing with your guards. Who asks you a question, what is it that you're reading? To you inviting him in, he explains things. So you probably, it could be 30, 40 minutes, maybe it could be a couple hours, maybe it was a long char- cherry ride, I don't know. But by the end of it, you are in, and you turn yourself in. And you basically say, hey, here's some water. Can we do this? That is how simple it is to turn yourself in. It's a decision. It is a decision, and you can totally overthink it, and I know exactly how it feels like, because I was feeling it as well. I was terrified. I had more, more, way more questions than answers. That's when you're in that desperate state, right? You have way more questions than answers, and no one can ever possibly answer most of your questions, because you're unable to process them, right? So your decision is very simple. Turn yourself in and trust. Trust God, trust people. In spiritually speaking, it's very simple. To turn yourself in, you need to accept Jesus as the Messiah and Lord, make him the Lord of your life, repent of your, of, of your sins, and get baptized. That is the act. It's uncomplicated. And it's absolutely significant and life-changing at the same time. And that one thing, when that one decision of saying, it's not complicated, I'm desperate enough to turn myself in, can change the rest of your life. And if that happened to you, can you say amen? And I will say amen. Amen. I see nothing, I understand nothing, I turn myself in, I just trust and do what I'm told, and here I am 20, what, 4, 25 years later. You know? And there are hundreds of stories like that. Many of them in this room. And many of them, if you're a desperate person, find somebody like that, and they will guide you. They will help you. Here are some questions for the seeker. And we're going to transition into into the Lord's Supper right now. But I want you to meditate and contemplate this. So I leave questions, right, to think about. If you're an enlightened seeker, so you're you're this person who who is pretty much has their act together, but know that there's stuff that's missing and you just, you can feel it, right? So you lean in and you go, how can I learn more? Here's my question. Are you willing to regain your full dependence so that you can get transformation out of it? Because the danger of being an enlightened seeker is that transformation stops as you, tra- as you become self-reliant and as you become, hey, I have my, my act together. It stops. Transformation only comes from God. And if your story is, is to continue to be a story of transformation, you need to be this enlightened seeker who says, I need to intentionally resubmit, reconnect, be dependent fully on God alone. For the limping seeker, will you have the courage, are you willing to have the courage to give up a victim mentality and this sort of underlying sense that the the world owes you something, you know, so that you can get transformation? Because for, for that, it's, it, it's, it, a victim mentality is a very comfortable thing. It's painful, and yet it's comfortable because it requires nothing of you. But are you willing to maybe have the courage to step out of that and just say to yourself, you know what? A lot of this is probably self-imposed pain. There's something I didn't get in the journey. There's something I misaligned with God with. Let me step out and not be a victim. Let me step out and find out what can I do? What can God, how can God transform me? For the desperate one, if you're a desperate, a misaligned person, 
either you need to get baptized in a chariot ride mode. You know, we're having a baptism right after this, by the way. Here's some water. We're doing it literally after service. Somebody's going into the water. Or if you've been disconnected and walked away from God, walked away from the church, from discipleship, and you have just fallen hard, you need to turn yourself in by just recommitting, being restored to a relationship with God and to a relationship with the body of Christ. That's what you need to do. And here's a question for the guides. And all of us are guides. All of us are called and invite to be, invited to be guides. Will you allow yourself to be used by God over and over again when it's uncomfortable, when you don't fully understand what you're called to do and why? Will you allow God to use you as a guide? You know, Philip responded to this very strange uh, request. And he talked to this very strange guy. And by all, from what we understand from the story, from, as being the account of the first church, this eunuch was the first missionary to Africa. He was the first one who went to Ethiopia and started talking to people about Jesus who talked to people about Jesus, who talked to people about Jesus, who talked to people about Jesus. How amazing is that? That one act of obedience can create such a wave of transformation. And you can be that person. I can be that person. I have been that person. And you have been that person. But what God wants us to be is that person over and over and over again. Let's pray.